Um, these are the news lines, and I see they broke one of the sticks. Sometimes that happens. We have wood sticks, and um, we also have fiberglass sticks, and we are in the process of replacing the wood sticks as they break. Sometimes they do. Um, you can't see from here, though. That's how good it is. Um, there's two lines at the base of the hill, which is where um, we've caught most of the cranes because they go running down the hill and they can't see them as much, but we also have a box around this bait. So here's the here. loop. And so then they would step in it, of course it would be on the ground, and it pulls tight onto their leg so they can't get away. But the stakes, you know, some of the stakes do come out, but that's part of the give so they don't hurt their legs. And usually one um, bird that we had, yanked a uh, grater, yanked out ten stakes in one shot. So anyway, that's what they look like. Homemade, but they work. <laughs> it takes a long time to make a new bird one. here. Uh, just released it and it flew off okay. It's actually a little bit stressed, but it took off and took, headed back for the wrist, I guess. Tell me about the uh, project and what you're doing when you band. Okay, for these birds, we're putting on a satellite radio and we're going to uh, basically track them uh, through the annual cycle from the uh, summering area here in Homer all the way down to hopefully in California or wherever they end up. Uh, we should find points in, during the migration in the fall. Uh, we'll also track them back north in the spring and uh, expect them to return here next May or April. Are you also doing some genetic work? We're also taking a blood sample from the birds so we can get the sex on the birds, which is good information to have. And, and uh, there's another PhD student that's looking at genetics. Uh, he's looking at the differences in different populations of in genetics of cranes, so he may have some interesting information from these birds. What kind of information could we possibly get uh, from the genetics? Well, just how different the, the various populations, how much variation there is between the lessers that are here in the Pacific Flyway versus the lessers that are called the mid-continent population that go down the Platte River in Nebraska and go down the Central Flyway through the winter in Texas, basically, through the, the center of the continent. Uh, we put a satellite radio on one leg. We also put a VHF radio so we can get more precise information on the birds on the ground uh, in the wintering areas and, and to look at their use of the landscape in the winter down there, look at what kind of crops they're using, how much they move around between different wintering areas, that sort of thing. So we'll learn a lot from these birds. So that's good. Okay, ready? It's video, so. Okay, I'm gonna let him go now, okay? population of the lesser sandhill crane in Alaska? In the, the well there's Pacific actually area. two formally defined populations uh, here in Alaska. There's the Pacific Flyway population which includes the birds here at Homer. They're probably a subpopulation of that big group. Uh, and then there's a mid-continent population of, of sandhill cranes which is kind of loosely defined because they basically uh, nest all across Canada and uh, even in Siberia, some of those birds, uh, they put radios on. Those are birds that go to the Platte River in Nebraska, go to the Central Flyway, which basically the birds end up, they go through Alberta, they end, uh, go to stage at the Platte River mainly in the spring, uh, and they winter in Texas and uh, New Mexico and northern Mexico. Most of them winter in Texas. And so that, and that's a much larger population. There's probably a couple hundred thousand birds in that region. Uh, we don't know where the boundaries are between these two groups of birds, somewhere between here and Fairbanks. That some of the birds that were marked around Fairbanks, or marked at Platte River, nest around Fairbanks, so they're not coming through this flyway. And, and some of the birds marked at Bristol Bay and around Anchorage uh, show up in California with the Pacific Flyway population. So unfortunately, there's not good population estimates for the Pacific Flyway population. Um, the only count that's done consistently that, that counts cranes uh, it's called a midwinter waterfowl survey that uh, state and federal biologists do every year uh, in January. And they also record cranes. But there's three other, or two other populations that winter together down there. There's graders, a Canadian subspecies, which is an intermediate, intermediate bird that are halfway in between the large graders, which are about uh, sometimes five feet tall. Uh, 
these lessers are about three and a half feet tall generally, and then this Canadian subspecies is intermediate. But all three of those populations winter together down in California, so they get a total count of cranes. And the counts in the last 10 years run about 45,000. We think there's about 10,000 graders and about 5,000 Canadians, but we don't have great numbers on any of those populations. Does anybody think that the Alaska population of lesser sandhill cranes on the Pacific Flyway is in trouble? Probably, but I don't know. Uh, that I don't know who that would be. I mean, uh, from the data on the midwinter counts back in the 60s, they were counting 20 to 25,000 birds, and now they're up to 45,000 birds. So I think all three of those populations have increased. Uh, and a lot of these crane populations are still recovering from historic intensive hunting. They weren't protected, they were market hunted. In California, they were shot, uh, that's where they're wintering. Uh, they were shot for the markets and back in, I think it was 1902, they were selling for $20 each in San Francisco because they didn't have very many turkeys around for Christmas dinner. And uh, so they were heavily harvested. They were down to less than five pairs breeding in California in the 40s. Uh, they, had, they went extinct in 1941 in Washington State. There were less than, a, less than 150 pairs in Oregon. Uh, these are greater sandhill cranes I'm talking about, and I know more about them because I've worked with them longer. But uh, the greater sandhill cranes have increased to about, I think, roughly about 10,000 birds now, so from about probably less than 500 total at one point. And all these populations were very depressed, and so they're still kind of recovering. But I don't know, you know, it could be different local trends. There could be some birds in Siberia that are coming across the Bering Sea and coming into this flock as, where, as well. Uh, in 2002, there was a Demazel crane that showed up in California with a bunch of lessers. Demazels nest in kind of central Siberia. And the only way I can figure it got here is by following some lessers down. And, and so there's probably more birds over there. And they may be doing much better in Russia than they are here in Alaska. I don't know. So there's a lot of questions. Regarding uh, survival of cranes, cranes live a long time. They have very high survival rates, uh, roughly 95 to 98 percent annual survival of the adults. But the major mortality factors for cranes are predators and power lines. Probably power lines take more cranes than, than predators, I think, uh, in some areas. But uh, the major two predators that kill adult cranes are coyotes and eagles. And if you look at the, the literature, uh, there's evidence that golden eagles are pretty important predators of greater sandhill cranes. And areas uh, like Homer, where you have high densities of eagles, is probably more of a risk to eagle losses. And, and there's lots of accounts of eagles attacking cranes and killing cranes. Uh, not very many of those are published, but there's a few papers out there that talk about eagles um, killing cr uh, cranes. Actually, there's one, one paper I remember in Florida where a six-year-old crane, a, a Florida sandhill crane, which are a greater subspecies, a big crane, uh, that and two other uh, cranes' legs were found in an eagle, bald eagle's nest there. So bald eagles are a pretty significant predator, and you can kind of see that if you watch the behavior of the cranes when an eagle's around. If, you know, they're always on the lookout, on the alert, and they're, they're very shy of airplanes because they mistake them for eagles a lot, and uh, they're really wary of eagles and usually flush if an eagle approaches uh, the flocks, and, and they do attack them. So they, they also take chicks, we know that. Uh, golden eagles and bald eagles take crane chicks, but a lot of predators take crane chicks. Anything that uh, probably bears take crane chicks, occasionally wolves. But, uh, in Oregon, coyotes and mink and great horned owls and northern harriers and golden eagles uh, all take, and raccoons all take crane chicks. So there's a lot of predators on the chicks. But for the adults, probably eagles and coyotes. And, and coyotes only get the adults when they're flightless, which is pretty rare. Most, most cranes don't uh, become flightless. Maybe about 10% of them lose enough feathers during the summer that they can't fly well. And, um, and when they're defending their chicks, uh, I've seen, personally, I've observed uh, pairs of cranes chasing coyotes and attacking coyotes that are trying to get their chicks and that's when they're kind of vulnerable to coyotes. Uh, eagles tend to attack them when they're migrating. Or what uh, stories I've heard in some, some papers in the literature. So they kind of follow the flocks and, and actually focus on the chicks that are in those migrant flocks. They learn to key on those. So. Sandhill cranes are ancient birds. Uh, they've been in the fossil record for millions of years. I think I've heard different uh, numbers, but something like 12 million years they've been around as a species. Uh, but beyond that, they also live a long time. We had, um, I used to work at Malheur Refuge, which is in eastern Oregon, and we had one bird that was originally banded in 1969, 
as an adult, and adult cranes are probably on the average about when they first start nesting about five to seven years old. Uh, it was banded in 1969 and was recaptured in 1983 and more color markers were added so we could follow it and, and was last seen in 2002. So it was monitored for 36 years. Probably at least a 40 year old bird. It could have been much older, we don't know because we didn't, people didn't start banding cranes and color marking them until the late 60s. But uh, at International Crane Foundation, they had a red crown crane that lived for 84 years. Of course, it was protected in captivity for all that time. Uh, it was producing fertile eggs at 79. So they can live a long time, and, and uh, species like cranes that live a long time generally don't raise a lot of young, and cranes lay two eggs. Uh, if they nest as successful, they usually hatch two chicks, but it's rare that they fledge two chicks. I see more sets of twins up here uh, in lessers than I do in the graders down in the States, but uh, anyway, they don't usually raise two, and, and uh, a very small percentage of the pairs raise a chick in a given year. Uh, in Oregon, I'd say about 3% of the cranes raise a chick in a given year. It seems to be a little higher up here, higher percentage, but still uh, they don't raise a lot of young. And so when you talk about hunting and uh, harvest of a species like that, you have to be very careful because uh, you know there's a balance between keeping the population growing and, and taking uh, removing birds from the population and so they don't recover very quickly. So they have to be very careful about hunting seasons on cranes and uh, it's been debated quite a bit around the country, but um, they just need to be sure they don't take very many uh, in their hunting seasons. And I'm not sure how well they get accurate counts on how many birds are taken in these populations. But uh, anyway, it's precarious to hunt these birds that live a long time. Uh, it's a little bit risky. And for animals like that that live a long time, adult survival is much more important than, than annual production. And, um, if they get stressed, they usually abandon their chicks sometimes if, uh, it's keeping themselves alive. And, and if they lose, if you lose an adult in the population, say a hunter takes out an adult, it's much more costly in the po to the population than losing a chick, which may or may not survive to, to breed uh, and doesn't have the experience to, uh, to start raising chicks probably for 10 or 12 years. And so um, anyway, it's, it's something that should be uh, carefully considered, I, I'd say. And what's your position with the International Crane Foundation? I'm, uh, I started working for the International Crane Foundation on a part-time basis to uh, work on, in Western North America, mostly in the Pacific Flyway, on crane conservation issues, which includes research and monitoring and uh, helping uh, land management agencies manage habitats for cranes, uh, helping with environmental education on cranes and so all those kind of categories is, is kind of my role to kind of coordinate that for the International Crane Foundation which works on cranes worldwide and so I'm kind of the man out west now here in North America.